Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I'm talking about movie reference books. Why you should have them, why I think they're a good thing, and I'm giving you some examples that I really like. And at the end of the video I'm going to give you 10 reasons why movie reference books are an important adjunct to the library that people get of movies, whether you're doing digital versions, whether you're doing physical media, Having movie reference books has a distinct advantage for you as a viewer and an appreciator of cinema. So let's get started. So first of all, I'm going to go through the movie reference books I've got, tell you why I like them, and suggest that you get them. So we're going to start out with one of the greats, one of the great showmen of cinema, particularly genre cinema, horror cinema, and that is Step Right Up, I'm going to Scare the Pants Off America by William Castle. This one is a lot of fun. William Castle is a beloved filmmaker. He never quite hit the A tier of filmmaking. He came close with Rosemary's Baby, where he was the producer on it, but the studio didn't want him to direct Nick or Robert Polanski to do it. But William Castle's book is basically a memoir of his history in Hollywood and how he started out being a kind of behind-the-scenes guy in a studio and working his way up to doing independent features and doing all the hullabaloo and hype that he did to promote the movies that he made. There's a picture of him on the back. You're going to like this too. It's got introduction by John Waters. What's not to love in that? Now, you probably can find a second-hand copy of this around if you look around. I don't quite know where, but you never know where you're going to find it. And if you are a fan of William Castle's movies, and I should do more of them on the channel, to be honest with you. There's a whole bunch I haven't covered yet. That one is a definite must-have for your collection. A lot of fun, and even though it is very much self-promoting, and there are aspects of it where I kind of think that William Castle may be an unreliable narrator in his own story, it's still worth being in your collection. You fill me with inertia. This one's got for 60 bucks on Amazon which surprises the hell out of me. Written by Paul Harris, based on the film by Mark Hartley. It's the actual handbook of Not Quite Hollywood, The Definitive History of Ausploitation in Cinema. And this one is a great adjunct to Mark Hartley's documentary about Australian cinema. And I'm going to show you the back page, but I've got to cover up some boobs. This is the back page. Ah, uh, yeah, it's terrific. It's very graphics heavy. But... It is a great adjunct to the documentary, which I recommend you have as well. Mark Hardley's documentary. In fact, all of his documentaries. The one he did about Canon Pictures, Electric Boogaloo, and also Machete Maidens Unleashed, which was about the exploitation films that were made in the Philippines by American directors in the 70s. All of those are great, but this one I like. I got this at the beloved polyester bookstore, and I paid 25 bucks for it. But it's now going for $60 US, second hand on Amazon. Can't get the sticker off now. But that one, if you can find a copy of it, you should definitely pick it up. Totally worth it. This one I love, because I love the guy. Director of own damn movie, Lloyd Kaufman's book, on making independent films. It's got a whole bunch of chapters on screenwriting, pre-production casting, managing your set post-production distribution. It's a pretty much a Bible of exploitation film manufacture. I got this one at Acme, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, and I paid 35 bucks for it. But I know that it's going for a lot more now. And if you don't love trauma films and Lloyd Kaufman's work, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of transferable skills that you get from reading this book. And some people have said to me, you ever going to make a movie? And my answer to that one is this. I do it three times a week. I make tiny little documentaries about movies and movie books. And that's the extent that I'm going to go there. I don't play well with others. Um, I try to. But I don't play well with others. I don't have the organisation skills to make a movie myself. And I'm kind of okay with that. What I do, stay in my own lane, get people to appreciate cinema. But that one, from one of the best, Lloyd Kaufman's book, is something you should have in your collection. Even if, you're not, even if you have no intention of ever making a film, it's interesting to get the behind-the-scenes stuff that he gives quite humorously 
in this book. As soon as that camera is off, he gonna f that little dog. This one's from one of the great schlock auteurs as well. I've got two books by him. They're not entirely and directly related to movie making, but they are a lot of fun. And the first one's Shock Value by John Waters, which is about his history as a movie maker and as a fan of schlocky and bad taste things in general. It's a lot of fun. There's illustrations in here as well. Lots of pictures. I actually went to Baltimore once upon a time in 1998, just at the end of the sleazy times in Baltimore. And I actually went to an adult bookshop just to experience a bit of the John Waters kind of feel about it. Luffy's work, very amusing, very witty guy. And if you can get a copy of this book, it's totally worth it. Incredibly readable. And I also have his other book, much shorter, but still a lot of fun. Crackpot, The Obsessions of John Waters. You should have this one. It's charming, it's witty, it's funny, it's naughty, it's transgressive. And John Waters does a really good job of it. I like the fact he collects Barbie heads, because I've got a couple of Barbie heads lying around the man cave and other areas of work as well. Incredible quotes here from people like William Burroughs and Playboy magazine on the back about John Waters. Very readable, very re-readable. You should have this in your collection. The next one's a pure reference book. Lawrence C. Bush's Asian Horror Encyclopedia. And this one covers the basis of all the Asian horror motifs. A lot of it's based on Chinese and other Asian folklore. And it goes through a whole bunch of monsters and gives you details of where they come from, who they are, what they do and why. And I just like diving into these books and serendipitously discovering a new monster or going, okay, I understand what that monster was in this movie. These kind of reference books are just fun to browse and increase your knowledge of aspects of cinema and also aspects of cultures that you're not already familiar with. Pick this up at Notions Unlimited, the bookstore that used to be run by my good friend Chuck McKenzie. And this was the sort of stuff Chuck had in Notions Unlimited where you go in there and just find random things like this and enjoy them. Really like this kind of reference book. They're not well known, they, they don't often sell well, but they are beautiful fun to just browse. Next two are kind of companion books to TV series. One's in slightly ratchet condition, I'll, I'll warn you up front, but the other one's not. Uh, the Official Prisoner Companion by Matthew White and Jaffa Ali, which is a companion to the Patrick McGowan TV series, The Prisoner from 1967-68. Lots and lots of information. There are detailed information packages about each of the 17 episodes. Really cool. Once went to Port Merion too. In 2004, I went to Port Merion where, where The Prisoner was filmed. Fantastic place. Beautiful architecture. Uh, uh, just a mad location and wonderful for that. There it is there. I don't want to dive too deep down the prisoner rabbit hole because I know there are obsessive fans out there. I see them on Facebook groups. It's one of those iconic and culturally important TV series that people just love. It keeps getting put out on Blu-ray and DVD and I don't know whether they're going to ever do a 4K. They might not be able to with the quality of the original uh, film. But that sits in my collection and I'll dive into it when I need a little bit of information about the prisoner i've also got a twilight zone one which i haven't been able to lay my hands on because it's in a box somewhere but i've also got david show and jeffrey frenson's the outer limits companion which has tons of information about each of the episodes of the outer limits i really should binge this again i've even got reference notes in there for future reference and i should do some outer limits episodes on the channel let me know if you want me to because I think that even though they were a bit monster of the week, there are still some interesting things there and things that people still love 60 years later. As I said, this is a kind of slightly ratchet paperback version. Well loved and well thumbed through. And just so much cool information about one of the two or three iconic science fiction anthology series of television. You should have a copy of this if you can possibly find it. It's important that we acknowledge and preserve the history of science fiction for ourselves. Now, a friend of the channel, Ian Fryer, has a book about this very same subject. 
called Carrying On the Carry-Ons and the Films of Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas, which was published this year in hardcover. It is available on Amazon. I'll post a link. But I've also got this larger picture book, which is about 20 or 30 years older than Ian's book, called What a Carry-On, the official story of the Carry-On film, which probably has less information than Ian's book, but I like a good hard cover book like this, which uh, I picked up secondhand. There's some stuff from Carry On Cowboy. And Viavision is releasing a lot of the Carry On movies on Blu-ray at the moment. And it's good to upgrade them because I've got the DVD on some of them. But Imprint is sending me at various times the Blu-rays of them with a lot of extras on them. But this one, even though it is kind of big for a shelf, is still a lot of fun to dive into. But I highly recommend you get a copy of Ian's book as well. This one's an oddity. It's a Picador book uh, edited by Richard J. Anubal. The Film Classics Library, it's called. It's a Maltese Falcon. But it's done almost in comic book form with stills from the movie and the dialogue underneath the stills all the way through the book. This, I think, may well predate owning physical media. And so if people wanted to preserve their memory of the Maltese Falcon and refresh themselves on what's actually in the movie, they had books like this, which transcribed it into dead tree form. The movies, I mean, there's the thing on the back with the main protagonists and antagonists. But it's a really weird artifact of the past when people couldn't own copies of movies. And yet, they w had the urge to own some kind of memento of the film and to remind themselves what was in the movie itself. Really an odd time before physical media was a thing for us. When people, and uh, there it is on the edge there. But yeah, it's, it's a kind of, uh, there are 1400 frame blobs, every scene, every word of dialogue, really of every moment of this classic. They've also got Frankenstein version of it and Casablanca and Psycho were apparently done in this format. But it's a totally weird thing and something that we no longer need because the technology has enabled us to hold copies of movies in our hands. Next up, if you've got Shudder as a streaming service, you know Joe Bob Briggs. But I've got the two original books of Joe Bob Briggs' essays. Joe Bob goes to the drive-in with a picture of Meatloaf on the front, which has a whole bunch of his reviews and the mailbag and everything else. Joe Bob was one of the first people to really appreciate and review in a serious way, and sometimes not serious, cult films of particularly the 60s, 70s, 80s. And I like the writing in this. It's all done in a colloquial, fake kind of cowboy style. They're good fun to read through and just remind yourself how it was before we could own copies of movies. And people actually had to go to drive-ins and hard top grindhouse cinemas to see things. And then we got Joe Bob Goes Back to the Drive-In, which is the second one of these. And it's got an introduction by Wayne Newton, which is really off-the-wall crazy. But it's a, a great collection of things. There we go. Hard Ticket to Hawaii, or was it Malibu Express? Which one's that? Malibu Express. So that's the kind of movie that gets reviewed in here. I like Joe Bob's stuff. I haven't read it in a while, but I really should dive back into that. Now, going back into classic movie reference books. This one's a book called The Celluloid Muse by Charles Hagem. And it's interviews with a whole bunch of classic film directors. There it is there. I've only got the book without the slip cover. And they're really interesting um, directors. Robert Aldrich, George Kukor, Frankenheimer, Hitchcock, Fritz Lang, Ruben Mamoulian, Louis Milestone, Vincente Minnelli, Jean Nicolesco, Irving Rapper, Mark Robeson, Jacques Tourneur, King Vidor, Billy Wilder, and their filmographies as well. It's all text, it's all interviews with the uh, directors, but I like getting these kind of books and just seeing what the directors said about themselves. Obviously, it is filtered through an editing process. But again, seeing the way directors in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even before that, 
saw themselves and saw their jobs compared to the way modern directors do. Is it really interesting to compare and contrast those things? This one's a lot of fun. The Big Show by Steve Pond, High Times and Dirty Dealings, backstage at the Academy Awards. So it's all about the things that go wrong and stuff up at the Oscars. And there's a lot of anecdotal stuff in here. It's very gossipy, but it is very fun. And there's somebody cleaning up at the Oscars on the back. Lots of information. It goes up to the 20, goes up to the early 2000s. But I like this kind of book as well because the Oscars are such a fake and, and bullshitty and, and self-promoting and industry thing that for some reason they've got the audiences to like. I never liked the Oscars much. I gave up on them when Lionel Richie won an Oscar for Say You, Say Me. I occasionally dip into them and, and see what's going on. I mean, there's the slap. There's all sorts of other things that go on at the Oscars. But for the most part, it's just basically an enormous... Hollywood and extended past Hollywood now circle jerk and I don't have a lot of love for it but I've got that book this one I like because I'm into censorship and understanding the history of censorship in movies it's called Forbidden Films by Dawn B. Sova censorship histories of 125 motion pictures where the author has basically gone through and documented how 125 well-regarded movies was censored and why it goes through the entire history of cinema and again it's one of those books where you can dip in look up the index find a movie that you like and find out how the gatekeepers of morality in cinema tried to stuff it up and tried to stuff up you as an audience member watching certain things in a certain way and how censorship was gate kept at a number of different levels there was the studio level there was the american government level there were governments in different countries like australia here and in the uk and there were also regional authorities who censored movies crazy amount of moral gatekeeping in cinema which still occurs but occurs for different reasons these days these two books by Robert Sellers are interesting. Hell raises a life and inebriated times of Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole and Oliver Reed. This one I picked up for five bucks. And it's basically a history of the alcoholism and self-destructive nature of Burton, Reed, Harris and O'Toole. Lots of details in it and it's kind of sad in a way because these guys were crazily talented but crazily self-destructive and the book goes into some detail on that and there's an extension of it which is an a to z of hell raises a com comprehensive compendium of outrageous insobriety by robert sellers which extends it beyond those four actors into a whole bunch of others and it's one of those things where there's a tragedy to the self-destructive nature of a number of these actors and many of whom died early because of those self-destructive behaviors and the fact that they didn't see what they did sometimes as a suitable job for a real man and yet of course it was but i, I kind of got a fascination for those particular kinds of actors and understanding why they did what they did to themselves and to the people around them this one's kind of interesting because it's a whole bunch of short stories that were adapted into movies called adaptations and there are things like bringing up baby there's the original short story of the swimmer by john cheever which was the basis for the burt lancaster movie there was uh the original story for the christmas story and minority report report a whole bunch of others so the going back to original sources and just getting the stories upon which a lot of iconic movies were based it's often good to do that and you can see how bits were trimmed and how bits were enhanced to turn a short story into a film that's another rabbit hole you can go down if you're so inclined this next one i like for a number of reasons it's one of the first real good analyses of cinema richard shiggle's movies the history of an art and an institution this is from 1964 it's a hardcover it came from the state library of victoria because there's a stamp in it that says it is and there's also a bunch of other bits where they've done things there's some more stamps from the state library of victoria and there's even an embossing i don't know if you can see it but there's an embossing there where they actually emboss the page 
and kind of said to people, yes, this is our book, and yes, you are going to respect that. And there's the borrowing stamp at the back, and there's actually rules of the State Library of Victoria here on what you can borrow. Things like notice to borrowers. Borrowers are required to make themselves familiar with the Lending Library rules. Number two, a charge of thrippence for every three days or fraction thereof is incurred by borrowers who detain books longer than 14 days, metropolitan borrowers or 28 days country borrowers. Borrowers are cautioned against writing upon marking or otherwise injuring books and their attention is specifically directed to Lending Library Rule 6. Rule 4. Lending Library books must be immediately returned in the event of an outbreak of any infectious disease in the house in which the borrower is dwelling. Rule 5. When a book is returned, a borrower receives his ticket as an acknowledgement of receipt. This ticket should be held by the borrower until another book is taken. Rule 6. Change of residence by a borrower must be notified to the librarian without delay. So there are tons of rules there just to borrow books from the library. And they're, they've got them basically stuck into each one of the books. That's a cultural artifact as much as it is a book about movies. And I love the fact that I've got this particular copy of it. Now the last thing is by a guy I know, a very talented man called Robin Penn, who in 1996 put out a book of essays called The Secret Life of Rubber Suit Monsters which is a bunch of essays about cult films that Robin did. It was published by Idolon Press. Here's a very cute picture of Robin on the back. And I love this stuff. Robin and I were up against each other at various times for some fan awards for writing about movies. Robin always won. He was much better than I was. And this one is such an underrated gem. I think it should be republished by somebody. If I was wealthy, I would republish Robin's book of essays here. It's hard to find a copy of. There weren't a lot of them. But I've got one of the rare unsigned editions. And there's... It talks about everything from Godzilla to Ewoks. And to latex and how the zippers up the back of rubber suited monsters were a feature rather than a problem with a lot of these movies. I love this one. Robin is a great supporter of this channel. In fact, he's commented recently about the channel. And I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that he is the man, he is the goat, and I love his book of essays. Just to finish off, here are the 10 reasons I've got for needing to have reference books. Rule number one, the internet is incomplete. There's a lot of information about movies, movie makers, movie stars, cinema in general, that the internet isn't going to give you. Reference books are going to give you a ton more information than the internet is at this stage. Number two, the serendipitous discovery. You find a mention of a movie you never heard of, and you quickly scribble down a note and go down a rabbit hole of finding out about that movie. I have found so many movies I love from mentions of those movies in various books. Sometimes fiction, but mostly non-fiction. These reference books encourage you serendipitously discovering movies. Number three, books are great wall decorations. A shelf of books tells you about the mind of the person who owns the room. And I like that. I like the fact that the passions of somebody can be displayed by their reference library. And that for me is something magical. When I visit someone's house and I look over their shelves and I learn more about my friends by doing that. Number four, each reference book about movies is a book written with passion by someone who's passionate about the subject matter. You don't dedicate the time and the effort to write a reference book unless you're passionate about something. And when you get a reference book that somebody has written, that is them giving you their passion and hopefully you share it. Number five, a movie is a more tactile experience than IMDb. Just picking it up and feeling the old cover of this book and seeing the image and, and wafting through the pages and the smell and the feel of it is something that can't be emulated by the internet. And I never don't appreciate that when I pick up a reference book. It's just, uh, more than just things for looking at. They're things you feel, they're things you smell, they're things you hear when you waffle the pages. They're much more immersive than the internet. Number six, if you look around, you can get them cheaply. 
If you look around secondhand bookshops, if you look around places like Clune's Book Tout every year, you can find books you never thought existed about subjects that you're interested in. And they're often three or four bucks. Some of the best reference books I know and books that I'm passionate about are picked up for one or two dollars on a table at a store. It's not an expensive hobby. Number seven, some of them increase in value. I've looked up a few of these books on eBay and our IMDb and, and Amazon and things like that. They're going for crazy prices now. A good copy of David Stratton's The Avocado Plantation, which is about Australian cinema in the 1970s and 80s, is worth hundreds of dollars now, and I picked mine up for $30. Your library of reference books often increases in value. Not that you want to sell them, but it's good to know you're not losing money on the deal. Number eight, you've got the excitement of diving down new rabbit holes. You see a reference book on a table at a auction or a fate or in a thrift store, and you pick it up and you go down a rabbit hole you didn't know existed, about movies you didn't know existed. There's a wonderfulness about that that I really appreciate. And yes, you can lose lots of lifespan doing it, but you're going to have a good time. Number nine, knowledge is good for your brain reading reference books and finding out about things and finding out the way people in the past saw cinema made cinema appreciated or derided it is good for your brain learning new things keeps your brain active keeps that neuroplasticity going and so every reference book you've got and read you're helping yourself keep your brain agile and that can never be underestimated and number 10 a movie reference book is a connection with the past and possibly the future. You're connecting with the history of cinema, which there's a ton of information about, but everybody goes on their own journey on that history. And we learn different things and we know different things and hopefully we share different things. And everybody has that connection with the past and the connection with history through so reading that. And it's a connection to the future as well because you've got to tell people about what you love. You've got to share the knowledge. You've got to share the passion. You've got to share, hey, this is wonderful. You should try this. Because we're all students, but we're also all teachers. And learning to share that passion and doing it without shame or fear is an important quality for a human being. So on that incredibly upbeat note... That's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, become a channel member and donate that way, or become a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies and donate that way. Got Science Fiction Saturday coming up soon. We've got the double feature on, Friday, on Sunday, Monday, and then we go through the whole thing again and I talk about more movies. And until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Read some movie reference books and have a great time just sitting on your ass and I'll catch you next time.